Hello and welcome to the Will Leach Show. I am the aforementioned Will Leach and I thank you for spending part of your day with me. Today's show is about nostalgia. I never watched Arliss, use both dollar signs as the S's of course, the show created by today's guests, Mike Tolan and Robert Wool. I have no reason for this more concrete than I couldn't afford HBO in the late 90s. Some people who saw it back then liked it, some didn't. I know there's a funny anonymous Twitter account that pretends to be obsessed with it, but to be entirely honest, it has not occupied much of my brain space over the last 20 years. But when I learned that it was going to be available on HBO Go this week, I instantly got excited about watching it. Why? Because it's old. I actually have no other reason for it than that. I might make it through one episode and shrug and never watch it again, or I might binge it. My eagerness to watch it has nothing to do with its quality or lack thereof. I just want to remember what sports was like in the late 90s. I want to see the crazy Raptors uniform, the brief window where Andre Risen was a serious cultural figure, and a glimpse of that period where Dennis Rodman had one of the electrifying personas in America back before he was, of course, the esteemed foreign policy statesman he is today. I want to go back to that time. No, I shouldn't want to. If you're too young to remember, I'll let you in on a secret. The late 90s were terrible. The NBA was still in its post-Jordan transition and had a horrible lockout that, when it ended, returned with all the players about 30 pounds fatter than when we'd last seen them. The Super Bowl winning quarterback was, ugh, Fred Favre. And the Yankees won the World Series, like, every year. Anytime you watched a major boxing event, they saved ringside seats for Fred freaking Durst. It was a terrible time. No one should ever want to return to that time. But I want to, simply out of empty, dumb nostalgia. I want to go to the past, however briefly, because frankly, I kind of want to escape the present. This is the curse of nostalgia. It gives you the incorrect belief that things were once better than they are now, which, if you've looked around right now, is a pretty tempting belief to hold. Now, I know it's not exactly the best time in human history to be quoting Woody Allen, but if you'll indulge me, he got nostalgia right in Midnight in Paris when he wrote, Nostalgia is a denial of the painful present, is the erroneous notion that a different time period is better than the one one's currently living in, a flaw in the romantic imagination of those people who find it difficult to cope with the present. That's what the present is. It's a little unsatisfying because life is unsatisfying. We go to the past to lie to ourselves. Now, I'll eventually watch our list and I'll get some idea of whether or not it's any good, but that's not really why I'm watching it. I'm watching it to relive the, relive the past, even if that past was stupid and horrible. Eventually, everything looks better in hindsight. So here's to hoping someday, 20 years from now, someone comes across the Will Leach show and says, hey, wow, remember the late 2010s? That was crazy. I remember back when people wore ugly ties and had horrible haircuts like that guy. I suppose we must provide our entertainment however we can. Joining us today are the men behind HBO's Arliss, which is now, for the first time since its run ended 16 years ago, streaming on HBO Go, though you should have already had the DVDs. Please welcome Robert Wool and Mike Tolan. <laughs> sir? <laughs> yeah, that's good to see you. Thank, thank you for thank coming. You very much. Thank, you, thank very much. you, sir. By all means, Hello. pleasure. Nice welcome, enjoy. As I mentioned before, we fit two Sklar's brothers on that couch, so you guys should be able to fit comfortably uh, on for the record it was only one dvd so you know yeah really we didn't uh, even get we didn't even get the whole dvd only singular so. Well, so they need to watch on yeah they, i guess they have to okay now they have to do it well, never mind then uh so i'm fascinated by the idea of timing when it comes to to our list you know this uh basically you know it ran for seven seasons and it ran right basically right before the sopranos like the sopranos came out, i think in the last season last the last couple, couple of years of seasons. It was a couple of years ago. and it feels like sopranos not only changed hbo but kind of changed like television that is peak TV era. So I guess my, my first question is, do you feel like that was good timing to be before then or bad timing to be uh, to be before The Sopranos? No, I think it was fine. I mean, we, also, we also have to throw Sex in the City in there Yes, also. that's true, that's true. Uh, no, it was t t it's of its time. I mean, I'm very happy that the way it worked out. I thought it was really good at the time. Um, it was a great time for HBO with Sex in the City and Arliss and Six Feet Under and The Dream Sopranos. On, I think Dream On. Dream On was earlier. Was that earlier. That was earlier. But we got a lot of viewers who were watching Sex in the City with their wives, or wives who were watching, having their husbands, and well, we'll keep watching the show. People who would say, not a sports fan, don't know a pass ball from a jump ball. <laughs> right. um, 
discovering our list, which, you know, really made us happy because the show wasn't just for sports fans, obviously. Yeah, that, that's kind of the fun. It's funny because, you know, obviously there's an obvious contract now with Ballers, which is the show that, that's on HBO. But it feels like to watch to watch some of these old episodes now, it feels just the tone is a little, is obviously different. I'm wondering, like, have you guys have seen, have you watched Ballers? Have you one seen episode. Why one episode? Like, what, like, do you think that that kind of tone was you know, it was like there were some darker episodes, you, and, you, and you certainly touched on some some darker things. But I think it was still a generally kind of like yeah. light tone. Is that is that you, or is, or is that the era? Like, were you trying to like when I, are you just a light tone person, or is it? Uh, well, it was it a com era? well. We started out as definitely a big broad comedy, and I wanted to go dark. <laughs> you kept pushing against it. By the way, <laughs> it's a half hour comedy, <laughs> Robert. Don't, don't, fight. Comedy. don't fight. Don't and, fight. Uh, and but I wanted to go. I, I had no problem with changing tones in shows. I, I enjoy that. I enjoy when you could have a funny episode that had a lot of dark moments, or you could balance it out. I mean, I think that's what gave the show its richness and took it to another level. I absolutely believe that. And, and still being funny. I mean, I thought we were always funny and entertaining. Well, that, in a sense, was how we were ahead of our time, because now half-hour television is often more drama than right. comedy, and hours are often more comedic. What was interesting about timing was that we were going in parallel tracks with Cameron Crowe and Jerry Maguire, unbeknownst to <laughs> either of us, right? So he was making the movie, which was even lighter. And the thing that, I, that, that, that we always, I think, felt proud about was, I mean, he made a romantic comedy. We made a comedy with dramatic overtones, but I think we worked a little harder at authenticity and accuracy and really giving viewers a sense of how the business actually worked. Yeah, it, it, it's hard to compare the two. One's a movie, under, right. it was a romantic comedy, and it's a good, very good movie. Uh, but we came out a little bit for it, but then again, he was doing a movie, so it took more time. And, uh, and I'm friendly with Cameron, so I, and I didn't know at the time. So, uh, but it, 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 I think it's of its time, I, and I think it's gonna, I think it's gonna hold up pretty well, especially when we got into the social issues. Yeah, and I'm wondering about that now because the world of sports now. The, I mean, never minding the world of sports, ever the idea of being a sports agent is different. The idea of of what players have to deal with and what agents have to deal with now. Do you feel like when you when we go back and watch these episodes now, do you feel that you're capturing? the way athletes in sports were in the late 90s? Or do you feel like that's kind of universal now? That a lot, like, it feels like I remember the Andre Risen famously being a, uh, being a big part of one episode. It feels like Andre Risen now, where you'd just be talking a bit about Twitter, or you, he would do something, there'd be a fight, an NBA fight, a fight with an NBA player on Instagram or something. Like, do you feel that the, the themes, as a sports fan now, as sports fans now, do you feel the themes of the show are the same as they were then? Or do you feel you kind of captured kind of that specific moment? Well, we went to some pretty dark places, as Robert was alluding to earlier. I mean, we were just going through a show because we had some music clearance issues where this uh, revered MLB player was about to be inducted into Cooperstown. There was an allegation of domestic violence. And at the end of the day, it turns out that he was probably guilty as charged, and Arliss has to make a decision. Um, we do have some fun, though, when we... Every, every time something insane happens in the sports world, we'll call each other up and say, what if Arliss was representing Lance Armstrong, Tiger Woods, <laughs> Ray Rice, you know, goes on and on and on. I, I think it's still the same crisis management. Yeah, it's the same kind of, it's basically, you know, I write about sports and I've written about sports for a long time. And one of the things people ask, like, how do you find things to write about? Things just constantly happen. Like, that's, that's a reason a show like this can go seven years. Is there's all, like, every day is a brand new plot line in the world of sports that's entirely different than it was the day before. Yeah, the idea of the social media would have a big impact now, and I'm sure we would use that in the show. Uh, the, the people he mentioned, and we haven't talked about, I mean, we had saw a meltdown the other day with Serena, and, and then we haven't really got to the real dark stuff right, of right, like right. Penn State and Ohio State yeah, and yeah. stuff like that. Could, do, do you think the format of the show would, it, I know you would go darker, but I mean, that's, that's really dark. Do you, guys, do you guys think that would, the tone of the show would still be able to breathe uh, when you go in this particularly dark I'd area? I'd love it. You love it? I would love it. <laughs> I think and he'd fight you on it, right? He'd fight no, you. I wouldn't no, fight on that. No. no, because, you know, Rita We'd, Stanley Kirby as, as the counterpoints to Arliss, as their, his protectors, his antagonists, I mean, covering for him, covering with him. I mean, we're pretty proud of that little ensemble there. And I think ultimately it's a workplace comedy and in the dynamic between 
the four people is really the, the centerpiece. Yeah, and Sandra Oh now is, mm -hmm. is killing it. She's, she's, she's everywhere now. Yes. I think it's, it's fantastic. Um, okay, we have a set of questions. We call, uh, our section, we call frivolous questions of dubious import. I have some for you, I have some for you, I have some for both of you, so be prepared accordingly. My first question is for you, however. You are an Astros fan, correct? You are a Houston Well, Astros I sold fan? beer in the Astros. I went to college down there. Yeah, I know. But, but I'm a baseball fan, but I guess I root for the Astros because I sold beer there, and I lived down there for a little, and I have a lot of still have friends down there. So, like, did you lose your mind when they won the World Series, or were you just like, I just like baseball. I don't really care. I we was rooting for the Astros. I was definitely okay. rooting for the, I was happy for the people, because I spent a lot of time down there, so I was happy for them. Okay, fair enough. But, so do you think they're, like, do you, the Astros have traditionally, like, this is the first World Series they've ever won. Like, I know, I know Astros fans that are still high. Frankly, <laughs> from uh, from that experience, I knew them high before they won. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Yeah. Selling beer to them. Yeah, you were there in college, so I was there I in college. Like, uh, yeah. the, it's, I always find it weird that the Astrodome is still there. Yeah, they can't. It is they, really. They odd. can't blow it up yet. Yeah. They, they it's like a monument or something like. Yeah, that. it's really strange. Like when the, there was Tiger Stadium a few years ago, and they hit someone put a drone in there before they tore it down, and the, right. they were just like like wild animals sure. living in second base, uh, tigers even. One last um, party at the Astrodome. Your baseball guys, do you? What do you think baseball's best decade was? I think you always romanticize about when you're growing up. Uh, oh boy, best decade for baseball. See, it depends on your team. It depends right. on your team. Right, if you're right. a Yankee fan, I'm a Cardinals you, fan. The '80s well, were amazing. The, right. the '80s are amazing. Uh, the, the '60s weren't so bad either. Yeah, I, like uh, this. I like the '60s. '60s you have Aaron, Clemente, Mays, and of course Richie. I don't know. There's a little unpaid right. political <laughs> announcement yeah, for my Philly yes, yes. hero. And but, you uh, have Mandel and Maris, and you, yeah. Yeah, you got a lot of, and then you got the Mets at the end of the '60s. Right. So yeah. I mean, that's a pretty good. Very that's solid. a pretty good. Uh, and you had Denny McLean. Yes. Yes. I mean, but you call it the golden era, right? From Jackie in '47 um, into the '70s, when I mean, big issue in modern day baseball is the disappearance of the African American. Yeah. Um, which has been supplanted by the dominance of Latin Americans. And um, now Asians. And now Asians, yeah. Um, but yeah, like like Robert said, it's you know those those seminal moments of like my team blowing a six and a half game lead with twelve to play. Oh, that's a tough one. You're never gonna get it. That's a tough. <laughs> I, I would say now again, if you're a New Yorker, mm. the fifties has got to be the, right. the forty-seven. You know that whole decade. Like uh, what, what did the Ken Burns, the center of baseball, whatever the mecca of baseball, that episode he had. You know when you had the Giants, Dodgers, and Yankees yeah. in New York City, that era was pretty. That's something I wish I could go back and I'd like to go to Ebbets Field. Is there an issue? This, cause I'm, I'm base, baseball is my sport. I love baseball; right. it's my favorite sport. But I always find it an issue that it very rarely, when people talk about baseball, to say, "Okay, now is actually the best time mm. for baseball." Though I would argue, like, there's a great joke about it. if Babe Ruth saw a curveball the way they're throwing it right now, he would run screaming out of the room about witchcraft and uh, and magic. Like baseball itself, uh, it seems like it's played at a high level now. But do you do you like are you do you like sabermetrics? Do you think sabermetrics are bad for baseball? Do you do you well, think that's hurting baseball now? I don't. Th I don't think it's hurting. It can hurt some decision making. Mm. Um, I think that the game is played by human beings, and so where the saber metrics and it's all it all based on fantasy. Right. This all comes back to fantasy because <laughs> of the numbers. Right. Uh, and I think fantasy has had a, an enormous effect. I think sa saber metrics is very very important. Mm. Um, I think a lot of it's theory though. That's where I, I mean, even war is a theory. Yeah. It's yeah. not a finite. When I hear they say, well, the war is more important than the RBI, I go, what are you, nuts? It's like war is a theory. The RBI is a, fi is, is, is a definite. I, yes, I suppose. I, I, see, I see what you're saying. I see what you're saying. Um, I don't know if I necessarily agree, but uh, we only have so much time. I mean, when they say about, okay, we, we're, we're judging in park factors. What, what, how are you doing that? How are you <laughs> judging in park factors? What, how are you judging in the weather in that park over there? How do you, I mean, and yeah. also then again, where is the sabermetric for modern medicine? Yeah. You know, where is so that? Do you think it takes some of the romance out of the game? Like, because it feels like a lot of times when people talk about baseball in the past, they this there is this notion that like the stats are too much now. There's too much stat stuff. There's not enough romance. Do you think that's part of it? I think romance is. I mean, the romance is when you grow up. I think it's right. all. I think that's very generational. My dad. You know, I'm sure we'll talk to the kids and we'll say. Uh, you know, I'll talk to my goddaughter, who, and I'll say. You know, she goes, look at these guys today. I go, yeah, but you didn't see Maris, Maris and Mantel and Aaron and George Brett. And my dad would say to me, yeah, you didn't see right. Clemente right. and you didn't right. see you know DiMaggio and you didn't see these Jimmy. I Fox. tell my kids they didn't see Ozzy. Like right, exactly. Right. 
Um, okay, this is a question for you, uh, Mike. You have done countless sport, many, many sports documentaries and worked with many, many people. And I find I've yet to see one that's not interesting. But I've interviewed a lot of athletes in mm -hmm. my time, and not all of them are always interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, who's the most boring athlete oh, or the most oh, difficult oh, situation luck. that you've had to whip your magic up to make them a little, the, to make the documentary maybe a little bit more? Well, I'm, I'm probably going to answer the I'm not going to answer the question, but I'll dodge it a little bit. Instead. I'll ask it six times. The okay. sixth time. We'll try. Challenging. How about boring is okay. a little tough. Challenging. Kareem was challenging. Okay. Okay. So Kareem said no, 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 a thousand times no, which is, of course makes me that much more determined to get it done. Right. And it was worth doing, and he's fascinating. He's smart, he's encyclopedic in his knowledge of way more things than basketball. I mean, if you ask Kareem what he wants to talk about, basketball wouldn't make the top no. 10. Um, but he is phlegmatic. He doesn't exude charm and charisma. He's reticent and concerned about everything that comes out of his mouth. And so it was a long battle to get him to say yes, and a very arduous journey to get the film done as our HBO compatriots would, would probably the test. agree. So keep in mind too that Mike did the first thirty for thirty on oh. who killed the oh, uh, on who killed the XFL. And of he course, doesn't count because he's not an athlete, but <laughs> I, but uh, and he's not boring, mm. but he is tempestuous mm. and he is mm, moronic and he is. I'll stop yeah, there. I remember. <laughs> yes, tempestuous and moronic both sound good to me. Um, oh, wait a minute, even unto that thing, what people don't realize mm. is Arla started every year, every episode, and this, this, was, this is 95 when we did the right. pilot. And Arliss would say, he'd say, uh, my name is Arliss Michaels, I represent athletes, these are my stories. And a book would spin out, and it would say, it would say Arliss, the, you know, the art of the sports super agent. Well, that was right, right, right after right. the art of the deal. Yeah. So that really, it, that's how I based this whole so thing. So why aren't you president? Why aren't <laughs> We'd you We'd be much president? better off, if I may say. I'm oh, running your campaign, Robert. Robert. Oh. Ugh. Free every, everything. Free every, everything again. Every conversation ultimately veers toward back uh, doesn't it? Um, okay, a couple questions for you. You wrote for Police Squad, is that mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Police Squad is, uh, uh, Police Squad, to me, Naked Gun is one of the most amazing things ever. But you, I did not realize you actually wrote for Police Squad. That's yeah. the, the, show, the original television series. Yeah, they, what did we do? Six episodes, they aired four. Yeah. They took us off the air. We were off the air so fast. I mean, it's, uh, um, that show, you watch that now, and it's like, I can't believe this was actually on. Like, Yeah, that was the Zucker Brothers yeah. and Jim Abrams. So that was a great time. I had a great time. I learned a lot on that show. That was like 82 or something like that. Yeah, of course. And so did you feel like Vindicated when Naked Gun came out and became this huge hit, and now it's, it, it kind of inspired a whole kind of generation of cops? Oh, without a doubt. Yeah. Without a doubt. <laughs> okay, this is a weird question. Is it true you were actually, I read this, I don't know if this is true. Were you college roommates with Julian Schnabel? Julian Schnabel, yeah, the artist, yeah, the filmmaker and artist, yeah. What, was, what, what <laughs> random? <laughs> like, well, the two Jewish kids down in Houston, right, Texas, right. we were roommates. Uh, was and he, he was painting back then, and he was incredibly talented back then. There is no athlete alive, there's no actor alive, with the ego of Julian Schnabel. <laughs> right, I Nobody. I, I mean, uh, but it's he's funny. And he's funny. Yeah. He is very funny, too. It's hard to imagine, like, getting yelled at by his RA or, like, or, or having to study for a test or something. But I don't, know. I, you know, Julian was a better student than I was. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Bar was set pretty low. Yeah, that's for sure. <laughs> okay, the last question. I want to ask about the uh, the Twitter account, the 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 Arliss, the, the kind of famous Arliss fan Twitter account that I've seen you retweet. I've seen you retweet before. It's kind of a fun. It's like it, it uh, it's taken personal credit for getting the show on HBO. God bless you. Um, I don't know if you, you've you've seen. I've seen you uh, read them before. It's kind of a ironic but kind of fun. I think uh, he account. has more followers than I do. Yeah. Have, have you seen Have you seen the account? I, I haven't I seen haven't. the whole. I, I have seen that up there though. Yeah, uh, I, I like the idea of them doing Arliss as the, in the Twin Peaks. Uh, yeah. it's been I'm, uh, thank him. I, yeah. Yeah, no, he's, he's been very much. Do we know who it is? I, no, I don't know. Wow. I, I assume it's Sandro. O. So he's, <laughs> he's vindicated. No, it's not Sandro. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, okay. now we're going to play a game. We're going to play a game uh, based off of the idea of Arliss and kind of the contracts he would negotiate. We're going to play a game called Are You Richer Than Tom Brady? I'm going to give you a list of seven athletes. You tell me whether in 2017 they made more money than Tom Brady or less money than Tom. That includes all earnings. Does not include endorsements. Does not oh, include does not include. You're talking about strictly from salary strictly and salary. from their profession. From the profession. Not okay. so like for example, for example, like yeah, like uh, Ronaldo probably makes like yeah. seven hundred yeah. million. I guess, yeah. Those don't count for it's what he gets from Real Madrid. Okay. Question number one, LeBron James. LeBron James. I don't know. I'd say I yes. I'd say yes. I guess yes. Not by much, but by little. That is correct. 30, 30 million. 35.6 yeah. million. Uh, Tom Brady makes 20 million. Okay. That's how much he makes. That's to uh, give you a baseline. Easy. So LeBron James, correct. Number two, Tiger Woods. No. No. That's correct. That's correct. Tiger Woods. Uh, that's not Tiger Woods, but that's Tiger Woods. And Tiger Woods makes made 3.8. Yeah. Year. 
Through three, Chris Davis, Baltimore Orioles first baseman. More. Chris Davis. More. Would more Why would he be in the list if it wasn't more? I mean, someone, yes, he makes someone's on to our game. Um, okay, that's correct. Uh, 21.1 million. Okay. Crazy. Obviously, and he's got a bunch more years. Yeah, that. and obviously had a better year than Tom Brady. I don't think there's any question. Yeah, he had a better year than Tiger Woods. <laughs> yeah, play baseball, everyone. Play, send your children to play baseball. Clay Thompson, Clay Thompson, more less. or less than Tom Brady? I'm going to go with less. Oh, God, I hope it's less. I mean, yeah, I'm, I guess. Clay Thompson's awesome. Uh, yeah, he's but a good uh, he's it's a good less. It's correct. It's yeah, 19 he's a good player. I mean, it's not Tom close. Brady. Yes, 19 million. 19 million. Okay, uh, Jose Altuve. Jose Altuve, more or less? Well, more in the new contract. Yes, but in 2017. Less, less. And less. He was still on that old contract. That's correct. Right? That's correct. That's correct. Okay, two more. Sam Darnold. He made less than Tiger Woods, yeah. probably. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. Sam Darnold, uh, quarterback for the New York Jets, who has played one well, game and won it. Well, he played for USC last year. Yeah. So he probably made more. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> ah, there we go. There you go. Uh, so, no, okay. Th this year, his Jets contract. Oh, less. He's not making 20. It's actually more. He makes 20.5 million in his really because it counts the signing bonus. Yeah, counts the signing bonus. I didn't, I didn't get to answer that, Robert. You Would you said yes? Yes. Oh my God. Easy to say no. Yeah, yeah, right, of course. Um, okay, and the last one, Mike Trout. Does Mike Trout more. make more? More, or? more for sure. More. That is correct. 34 million. Yeah. For Deserves it. Kershaw for too. For Kershaw for makes more. Okay, the last thing we do in every and, show. And and Arles is, who do you think Arles's biggest con, biggest? I was thinking about this. Who would be his biggest client? Now, wait. Yeah, I mean, if you thought about all the clients that he had, I give up. I gotta believe Mayweather. Oh, Mayweather. Yeah. Mayweather. Money Mayweather. That right. would uh, that would the, the domestic violence issue that you talked about. That would be we like we had Mayweather right on when he was still pretty boy before he yeah. was money. Came right out of the Olympics Amazing. and and uh, and he was always great to us on the great. show. We were very fortunate. You guys had Jack Buck, one of my heroes. Jack Buck. Yeah, we did. We had yeah, yeah we had, we had Oscar yeah. De La Hoya, on, who's now managing this yeah. weekend's fight. Yeah, we had we had like Frank DeFord. Yeah, oh yeah. We had a lot of guys. We lost a lot of guys. James Coburn was his last yeah. show, uh, doing a DiMaggio S character, which is one of my favorite shows. Uh, we had quite a few. Ken Howard, the late great Ken Howard, oh, yeah, who did yeah, both. Yeah. Who did both Mickey Mantle and Bob Knight, basically yeah. both of them. <laughs> he played a character named Rocky Fromaggio, right. the Big Cheese. Oh. <laughs> of course. Okay, last thing we do. Uh, I don't know if you ever played the board game Outburst, where basically it's like Family Feud played really fast. We put 30 seconds on the clock, okay. and I give you a category. If I were to say. Books of the Bible, you would have 30 you'd have, seconds. You'd to have leave. a bad guess. Yeah, I, I wouldn't do that. I wouldn't do that. Uh, but so 30 seconds on the clock. Name as many as you can. There's no wrong answer. I mean, there are wrong answers, but if you say the wrong answers, you're not. We're going punished. together? We're yeah, just yell them out. Okay, we're team. Just yell them out. <laughs> Family feud. Yes, exactly. Okay. Yell them out. Just yeah. Yes, exactly. 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 Uh, Steve Harvey is just around the corner. Uh, okay, give me the 10, 30 seconds on the clock, the 10 highest grossing baseball movies. Not adjusted for inflation. The 20 highest grossing baseball movies. The 20 movies. or 10, you said? Sorry, sorry, 10, excuse me. Okay. 10 highest grossing baseball movies. The, the 30, Natural. 30 the natural. seconds on the clock. The okay. Rookie. Go. The Natural. The Rookie, yes, the Natural, no. Hardball. Uh, no. No. <laughs> not, not Summer Cats. Is Bull Durham on the list? Bull Durham is on the list. Bull Durham is on the list. Oh, I know, Cob I know Cobb's not. Old. No, it's too old. Cobb is not. Too old. Uh, Cobb, it's Cobb's, uh, Cobb makes less than Tiger thing. Woods. Uh, Major League. Major League, yes. Yes. Major League Two? A no. League of Their Own. League of Their Own is the number one grossing baseball movie of all Really? Time. Baseball movies. Did Adam Sandler do a baseball movie? No. Um, let's or see. You said the did word that word. other Costner movie? What if I Field of Dreams? Are you counting that as Field of Dreams movie? counts. Time. Okay. Just under the buzzer. You got League of Their Own, The Rookie, Field of Dreams, Bull Durham, and Major League. You missed Angels in the mm. Outfield, okay. Rookie of the Year, The Bench Warmers, which is yeah, yeah, Rob yeah. Schneider. Yeah. Rob Schneider, The Bench okay. Warmers. Give your kids your immunity shots. Moneyball and 42. Yeah, Moneyball. Money ball, 42. 42, 42 is number two. Yeah. 42 is number two. I did not. Should have gotten that one. Yeah. So, well, guys, crying out loud, thank you for coming on. Thank you for playing around, you for playing around with me on this uh, silly show of mine. Uh, the show, uh, of course, is RLS. You can find it on HBO Go. Go and HBO Now and On Demand. HBO Go on demand, and Now and HBO Then. HBO Wherever later. your HBOs are. are and you get all 80 uncut episodes, and um, you can binge. I mean, I'm looking forward to it. I, I haven't seen a lot of them in a long time. <laughs> well, we know what uh, you'll be doing this weekend. You're People will be watching. I'm actually going to the fight. You're going to the fight? We're okay. going to the fight. Well, stream it on your phone while the fight is going. Going on <laughs> just to, just to, just, to, just in case the, the camera catches That's fair enough. Like, I think people hey. will tune in to watch the Les Moonves episode. That's right. Les was on the show. Oh wow. Les was on the show. Oh, okay. yeah. He was a good actor. You're keeping that one. Keeping well, he started. One. He well, he started as an actor. Thanks, Will. Okay, so this has been the Will Lee Show. Please come back in the future to SI.TV.
or wherever your will leeches are sold.